So we're going to start with the introductions. Uh, my name is Dwight Otwell. I am the current chair. And uh, normally we have everybody go through, but I'm just going to read the names off. And uh, if you would just raise your hand and when I come through your position, please. Uh, next up, we have Nick Neptune, who is the vice chair. He is not here currently. I don't believe he's had a chance to sign on yet. And uh, Mr. Black, if you would please um, take in a note that we need to update the agenda and stuff with the new vice chair information. Sorry for a naggy detail. Uh, next up will be Commissioner Elizabeth Alley, and I think I saw her sign on, but I don't see her video yet. So she will be coming on soon. Commissioner Barsness. Commissioner Hatchell. And we have Commissioner Hester is online. And Commissioner Tong. I, Ms. Hatchell, did you say you saw uh, Pierre, log in. I don't, is my screen's yeah. not going full. Let me show the, is he on? I saw him. He's waving at you. Okay, cool. I need to change my layout to grid. Pardon me. Oh, there now everybody is. All right. And I don't believe I see Commissioner Woodall on yet, but we have Commissioner Caruso, who is the current chair of the policy committee, and Commissioner Thomas, Commissioner Gellenbeck. She is here, and uh, we don't have Commissioner McLean here with us yet. Also, I'd like to introduce Mr. Paul Black, who is the Bicycle and Pedestrian Program Manager. Mr. Eric Lamb, who is our uh, short-term planning, transportation planning director. And I believe I saw Ms. Goodall. And where is your actual, the mo micro mobility coordinator for the city? I'm, I will memorize that next time. I apologize. And I don't see uh, Ms. Person. Is she on board with us today? She is not. She is conserving her hours right now until the end of the year. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think that does it for introductions. Did I miss anybody that's on yet? Wonderful. Next up, we'll have approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. And, if, and Mr. Otwell, before you go there, if you'll make an uh, amendment to the agenda and indicate where we will be hearing the police department this evening. Oh, excellent point. Thank you very much. I would like to move that we amend the agenda to allow the police to present in section four as the first presentation before the six forks presentation. Second. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. If there's any opposed. All right, yes. uh, thank you very much. And Mr. Lamb, is Mr. Cantrell with the Six Forks presentation? Is he on? Do you mind if we yes, sir. hear him real quick before we get started? So uh, if you can hear me, uh, Mr. Cantrell, we got a really full agenda this week and I wanted to get your feelings to see how important it was to get you on this month or if we could perhaps table your presentation and ask you to come in November. I am fine either way. Um, I, I'm here all night and I can come back next month as well. So whatever works best for the commission. Well, I'm going to ask and, and move that we table your conversation until next month, but uh, you certainly don't have to stay on for the whole time, but we, we would love it if you would. But so I would so move and uh, could I get a second? I'll second that. All in favor? And are there any opposed? All right, well, that will carry as well. Thank you, Mr. Cantrell. We look forward to it next month. All right, so that brings us up to approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Has anybody had a chance to review and ready to make a motion to approve the minutes? And I'll second that. Mr. Thomas, uh, Commissioner Thomas uh, makes the motion and I'll second it and all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Uh, thank you. And that will move us on to public comments. And as it's going to be a pretty long agenda tonight, um, I'm going to ask that the speakers limit their comments to five minutes. And you're going to have to trust me. I'll keep it on my phone. We don't have the fancy stuff that they got at City Council. So if you will, uh, Mr. Uh, Lamb, do we have anybody signed up to speak tonight? 
Uh, I've not received a uh, notice from anybody. Um, I believe Adam Howarth indicated he wished to speak. Um, there we go, Adam. If anyone else is on the call that would like to speak, just send me a message in the chat and I will add you to the queue. Uh, first up is Adam Howarth. Adam, you're unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Dwight, uh, Chair, and the rest of the commissioners. I do want to thank uh, Chad Cantrell especially. Chad, you've done an absolutely fantastic job on planning for the Six Forks Road corridor project and including bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure as well as transit in the face of some outspoken comments uh, against those, those uh, facilities. Uh, Eric, can I share my screen? Is that a possibility? It is not, unfortunately. Sorry. Okay, fair enough. I submitted uh, my written comments to the BPAC uh, in anticipation of this meeting. And I'll review basically three key points that I think need to be considered to make this project go from the best in Raleigh to becoming the, a world-class example that perhaps even the League of American Cyclists would take note of and other cities could follow us as a leading example of how to make bicycling really effective. Number one, please integrate the bicycle paths and sidewalks carefully with both Carroll Middle and Green Elementary. It is so imperative to have a really tight connection so that where the bicyclists go, the pedestrians go, the buses, the parents, and where everybody is supposed to be and they come and go from school, that is a huge driver of a lot of the traffic and, and activity on Six Forks. And it, it's not uh, really very clear to me on the plans how cyclists especially will, will navigate to the bicycle parking at each school. Secondly, the protected intersections the, it, it's hard to tell from the plan, so maybe it's done, but I would strongly encourage uh, the plans to include raised crosswalks or the raised bike paths at the level of approximately six inches above the regular roadway where, there are, where those intersections are, that the bicycles and pedestrians have level and flat access throughout the intersection and the cars and the car paths have to slow to go over those raised portions. So basically raised crosswalks throughout the entire project. Uh, that would definitely slow traffic, but that is the goal. If the speed limit is to be reduced from 45 to 35, then we should not expect any driver to have any physical way to go over 35 without damaging their car. And I think that right now the road design would encourage 40, 50 mile an hour driving still, even though the road lanes are narrow. Lastly, I would point out that the sidewalks at the protected intersections and this seems to be the case from my review of the plans, but I could be mistaken that they have very strange and jagged lines as they approach each intersection. I would encourage uh, all designers and everybody involved to think about being a walker in the form of go paths or just walking. I'm going to walk in the straightest line. I'm not going to follow a little zigzag uh, sidewalk just because that's where the cement is. And it's going to put me in the wrong spot on the intersection, not where the crosswalk is. And that seemed to be a challenge throughout the project when I looked at it. I'm sure there's real estate concerns and cost constraints and others. I would uh, ask that that be reconsidered so that the lines, the line of sight for walkers is more direct across all the intersections in all directions and that they're given priority no matter the design implications to vehicle traffic. Thank you so much, uh, commissioners. I wish you the best of success this evening. Thank you, Mr. Haller. I hope you'll stick around because a lot of the comments that you brought up were addressed in our committee and will get covered in that report or the presentation. And uh, some of the other things were some great questions. I think they'll come up as well. Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to speak at public comments? All right, that moves us on to presentations. And I believe first up we have, uh, allow me accept just a second. We're gonna have two presentations and then we'll plan to take a break. So if anybody's looking at their schedule and planning their evening, uh, of course, if you need to take a break at any moment for any personal reason, um, we won't take any votes without you for a reasonable period of time. And uh, I, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Lamb and the Raleigh Police Department. Eric, I think you're muted. 
Can't hear you. That's good. Uh, if I'm making mistakes, then I'm muting. Um, I believe we have uh, Officer um, Morris and uh, Lieutenant White from RPD with us this evening. So, uh, gentlemen, take it away. There you go, Derek. You're up. Okay. All right. Um, I'm Officer Morris. I recognize a lot of familiar faces from the years past presenting. Um, so I'll be doing pretty much what we we've done in the past with presenting the numbers. Um, do do we have the the visual? Is that something that we can do or? If you'll give me a second, it's not letting me open the file. So give me one minute. You can keep going. I'll endeavor to get okay. that open for you. Yep. Barbara, I just sent you the file. See if you have the uh, administrative ability to share this. Sure, give me one sec. There you go. Is everyone seeing the screen? Okay. Um, so this is what we usually pre have presented in the past. And I believe we got two years to talk about here, uh, 2020 and up until this point for 2021. Um, so you can see this is the, we're talking about bike and pedestrians. Um, last year for 2020, um, kind of kept with the trend of the elevated fatalities with pedestrians and the pedestrian crash upward trend uh, continued to stay trending upward. Um, we did have the one bike fatality as well. Um, the the one bike fatality, uh, the details on it from from what I remember, it was not my case, but it was, you know, another member of our squad took this case, but the bicyclist from what I remember was using uh, the crosswalk and was going on the sidewalk and cross when the light was green for the traffic and crossed in front of traffic. Um, and the bike had been on the sidewalk prior and just went through the crosswalk as it would a pedestrian. Um, the pedestrian where there's split numbers, uh, larger numbers on the left will be our fatalities, and then the cases on the right will be the cases we got called out to that were serious enough where they potentially may have been a fatality, so they called us out in case that were to get to that point. And for the, the people that may be new, the crash reconstruction unit, we typically respond to fatalities, or if it looks like the potential is there for a fatality, uh, and that will respond out for those crashes. So you can see the the cases that we've picked up in the throughout the years, and then the callouts. Callouts are just going to be when we're actually at home, 
Um, so we work a Tuesday through Friday, uh, 10 hour shifts, uh, seven to five. So you can see majority of when we get called to a crash occurs outside of those that time frame. So a lot of times they're at night. Um, last year we saw an increase in daytime uh, cases. This year, as far as this year's numbers, I did this Friday. And in case you happen to see in the news over the weekend for the number of fatalities for 2021, five can be added for sure and potentially a sixth one that was a pedestrian. Um, but we did have the single car five person fatality over the weekend. Um, I, and Lieutenant White's joining this year, which is new, and I think he'll he'll talk about a lot of the programs that we're doing to help with these numbers with speed enforcement and pedestrian projects that have been done. Um, there, any questions for me, any trends that we may see or any anything with the the graphic shown here? I I don't have any questions. I don't. Let me see if I can get my grid back. Is anybody raising their hand? <laughs> um, Commissioner Thomas. Uh, what does the ABC column, what does that represent? Oh yeah, sorry. I should have explained that. That is actually uh, impairment related cases. So alcohol or drug use. So that has trended upwards. All right, I can see everybody now. And I, I will hold our broader comments for the end, I believe. I think we're good to go. Thanks. Oh, Mary Jo has her hand raised. Oh. Uh, yes, thanks, Eric. I, I'm interested in the, what MOT means. Motorcycle. Yep. So I believe we're good to to bring on Lieutenant White if he's ready to go. Hey, good evening, everybody. Unfortunately, I uh, don't believe my camera is functioning. Can y'all hear me good? All right. Well, I'm Lieutenant Jeff White. Uh, I've been with the department 27 years. I'm currently assigned to the Special Operations Division. I oversee Derrick Squad, which is the Crash Reconstruction Unit, as well as our Traffic Enforcement Unit. And tonight, I thought I'd touch base on some of the enforcement actions that we have taken since I've come on in May. To touch base with uh, speeding related as it pertains to bike safety, pedestrian safety, crosswalks. Uh, back in 718 of this year, we did uh, two projects uh, called Watch for Me NC, which are crosswalk projects. We did one at uh, Blunt and Franklin, where we stopped 37 vehicles for crosswalk violations. Each driver was given a pedestrian safety flyer during the stop so they could be informed on crosswalk safety. On 818, we also did a similar project. Uh, we did that one at Peace and Blunt, we, where we stopped 18 vehicles, same type of situation. Every violator was stopped, handed a flyer for pedestrian safety. On the 21st of August, the downtown district community squad uh, did a bike safety event where we actually set up cones, had some signs, and did a uh, technique class where we demonstrated proper bicycle riding, uh, wearing of the helmets, that kind of thing where we could teach, especially younger people, the safety of uh, riding a bike in a city situation. Now, beginning, that'll lead me into some more of our enforcement actions, especially in the Glenwood area. We have begun an initiative starting the weekend of September 24th in Glenwood South in our hospitality district, which would be essentially the 100 block to the 600 block, where every Friday and Saturday night, we have a supervisor, a sergeant, and eight officers that are stationed up on Glenwood South starting at about 10 p.m. and we'll go to 2 a.m. to monitor quality of life violations and especially be present during the 2 a.m. Uh, where the bars are letting out so that we can assist in shutting down Glenwood Roadway itself to help pedestrians get back to their cars, to look for quality of life violations, noise violations, speeding, loud vehicles, that such. We've been doing that for three weeks now, establishing a really good rapport with the uh, owners of the bars and the patrons. Got a lot of good positive feedback on that. With that, we ran a uh, speeding s survey and a, an enforcement 
in the five points area. We did that from July 1st all the way to July 7th due to a citizen complaint of uh, heightened speeding in that area. During that time frame, we stopped over 70 cars and wrote about 60 citations. We right now have a current project going on in the 1000 block of Glenwood per the request of Captain Wood. We've been given some information. There's been some speeding complaints in that area. We only got to run that for two days and then the state fair came into town. As you can imagine, I've had to divert some of my resources to that. Uh, during the fair, we try to keep as many officers in that area to take care of traffic control and wrecks and such. But as soon as we get the fair moved on, we will get back to the thousand block and that'll be a priority for us. Just to kind of give you another um, overview of our traffic enforcement unit that consists of one sergeant and six officers. They're on our motorcycles. Generally speaking, when we don't have any other pressing situations going on, they like to go out every morning when they work day shift and target school zones. For instance, right before the fair hit the town, uh, Sergeant Scioli and his group, they worked Fox Road Elementary and Jeffries Grove. They try to do that and then move on to whatever speed complaint locations that we have. For the future, uh, we're looking to partner up with State Highway Patrol. I don't know if uh, y'all saw in the media recently, we did an initiative out on 540 where we were uh, targeting speeders on 540 in the morning rush hour, which was very successful. Uh, we're gonna try to do a couple more projects with them coming up. And we're also looking forward to Halloween Booze It or Lose It, which should be coming up where we're gonna partner with several agencies, hopefully, and either run a checkpoint or something similar to that nature uh, so that we can be seen and be out and about in the public so they can see that we're out stopping cars again. And unless you have any questions, that's all I have for right now. That that's wonderful. Thank you. I had not heard about the watch for me in C campaign back in July and August. So that's very excellent to hear. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of questions. Uh, we put together a, uh, list of written questions back for the retreat when we were still hoping that uh, we could schedule something together and uh, we didn't have a chance to deliver it to you then but I hope that perhaps we can send it to one of you guys and I don't think they all belong with your department because the questions that this group has about pedestrian safety are very wide ranging so um, it would probably have to get shared up uh, with different departments so if you wouldn't mind if uh, I share that with one of you guys. Um, Send it directly to me, sir, and I'll be more than happy to share it with whoever needs it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And with that, I we, will. Uh, uh, yes. We do. We we do have some the uh, two part question with the crash analysis, the safety enforcement, and the greenway stuff. Okay. Uh, if you do exactly. have responses to the questions that you received, I think that would be the the best way to jump into it. Yeah, we, we can't answer all of them because some of them just don't pertain to our specifics. Um, oh, absolutely. But I think we, we could help with some. Um, and the very first one is how can the BPAC or the public access crash data and mapping of trends? Um, I sit on the Vision Zero Task Force, um, and that's a great resource for crash mapping data, and it probably gets a little more in depth, but we have a slight delay in the reporting data, but because a, a DMV 349, which is a crash report is public record, they have access to that. And eventually I think it's a six month delay is what they say. Um, but I mean, you can, you can really limit the specifics of crash data on that website and it's a great resource. That's ex oh, um, Commissioner Hatchell and then Commissioner Gellenbeck. Yeah, I, I would just like to thank you both for being here this evening and, and taking time to be with us. And we know that there's uh, there's a lot of challenges to the work uh, you have to do. And um, I really appreciate all that you have to do. And yes, like you mentioned, the state fair just makes it busier. So. Um, uh, I do appreciate hearing about the five points and the other Glenwood uh, areas. That's been an ongoing concern to the to the commission. Um, I was wondering, uh, and I guess it, it, Dwight, you had mentioned, you know, there's uh, there's there's a some of this is enforcement and some of this is some other things. But I think it was in the 2020 downtown um, 
pedestrian uh, report that was done, you know, it was really found that a lot of cars are not yielding to pedestrians at all. And sometimes I feel that that has to do with that the crosswalks are getting kind of old and that's not your problem. But, um, you know, you mentioned the things you had done. Are, are there are there a lot of ongoing initiatives to try? I mean, what I guess I'm, I'm kind of concerned. What else could we do? What else can we do um, to kind of make it a little bit more aware? I know a lot of cities have the signs that kind of go in the pavement or, you know, a thing about yielding to prevent pedestrians and making that well known that it, that it is law. And uh, several of us did the white cane initiative on uh, Friday, last Friday evening to talk about, you know, if you, if you see white cane, that's the law that you're to stop and give the, the right away to that person. So I, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, what could we as a commission or the other departments within the city be doing from your perspectives to help pull this together a little bit more cohesively so that we, um, you know, that we're all working together toward that same end since, you know, you, you're able to, to do a certain part of it. Um, and I know that uh, uh, I believe uh, Officer Morris, it was you were on the Greenway call when we were talking about how the speed has gotten really kind of ridiculous around town. There's a lot of drag racing and things going on. So I guess I would just love to hear if there's some thoughts that you gentlemen have for us this evening on um, techniques or signage or curb extensions or refuge islands. I mean, what kind of things could be helping uh, from the police perspective? I, I can jump in on that. Uh, I think one of the main things is now we have a public information officer who does a lot with our social media aspect. That could be something that we could look into uh, to get educational pieces out. Uh, that would be something we could easily work with the chief's office. Any concerns like that that y'all have, we could definitely put that together, put out some uh, things on, I, I believe we do like a Facebook blast. We do Instagram, I think the news outlets. We also do uh, various alerts every now and then and that is something we could obviously utilize that i think you get the message out to people what you're what you're referring to i also added uh captain gunther who uh wanted to weigh in i believe by all means please hey good evening everybody uh my name is steve gunner i'm a captain with special operations division uh uh, Lieutenant White and Officer Morrison all work together. I, I just wanted to chime in on that. Uh, my previous assignment was uh, downtown district commander before my current one. So I'm uh, very familiar with uh, the challenges of, of downtown and our increased pedestrian, uh, especially as we're really fully coming out of COVID for the, for the most part and people are really excited being out again. Uh, downtown is revitalized. And uh, ma'am, to your question, I think it needs to be a multi-pronged approach. Uh, it is not, in my opinion, a situation where you can get out of it simply through enforcement or simply through education. I think it really needs to be all uh, bound together. And, and working with the city PIO, the, the department's PIO, also some, some enforcement of the most egregious things and an educational piece, uh, and, and and you stated a lot of it is topography related as you crest hills and crosswalks in there. And we frankly have got a lot of new people that's moved into our area, uh, which is a great thing for our economy. Uh, but but we need to be sure that people are being held accountable and, and also uh, conduct themselves in a way that's advantageous for everyone to be able to enjoy it. So I think it's just really a, a collective uh, initiative between several entities with the city, of course, the police being one of them, but I think we really need to hit it on the education piece. I think we need to work on our, our, our the topography, our signage, and also uh, the, the, the enforcement part as well, I think is important. But, but, but really what we want out of all of this is, is the voluntary compliance, right? We don't wanna to have to be writing people tickets. That really doesn't do anything. What we want are for people to understand what the rules are and then take it upon themselves to comply with them so that uh, our pedestrians and uh, are safe, our bicyclists are safe, and our crashes go down. Because that just speaks directly towards our quality of life that we have. And uh, unfortunately, while pedestrian accidents are, are few and far between compared to vehicular, when we do have one, the level of injury is typically high. So we definitely want to mitigate any any situation that we can that would allow uh, allow us to reduce 
of the number even further than what we have. Thank you, Captain Gunner. Uh, are there any more questions from the commissioners? Ah, I'm sorry, Commissioner Gellenbeck, I forgot you from the first time, please. Thank you, thank you, Dwight. Uh, yeah, I wanted to just re, uh, revisit the Vision Zero uh, website. Is that the National Vision Zero website, uh, Officer Morris? Do you do you know the their uh, the URL? The Vision Zero. Um, it, it, nor, it should be the North Carolina Vision Zero. Okay. Okay. Zero great. Web. It should be North Carolina Vision Zero. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Thomas. Thank you. Um, I, I just have a question about the, uh, the projects that I think Lieutenant White mentioned. Uh, does the department do any kind of uh, data collection, kind of setting a baseline and then to see if these projects are effective at all in reducing speeding beyond the period in which they are uh, ongoing? Or is the, the purpose simply to step up enforcement during the period of these these efforts um and is there any follow-up afterwards of any sort to see if speeding is reduced after the period of these sort of uh, i think projects as, as you call them the answer to all three of those questions is yes we do collect that data and we do look at it to see uh, mainly one of the things that we really take to look at is time of day day or night when the violations are the heaviest we also take into account the citizen contacts that we make of uh, so far, like with community meetings, like Captain Gunner mentioned, he was a district commander. He would have a lot of people that would bring things up to him saying, hey, we have this at this time. So what we would try to do is cater a response to match that time so that we could see, yes, do we have a complaint here? Is it viable? And what do we need to do to take care of it? We also have um, what we call speed measuring devices that we can put out in certain places if we can't physically be there, where we can actually leave these devices out for a week at a time and track what's actually going on there, uh, how many cars are coming through, what is the average speed, what is the highest speed. And that way we can determine then whether or not does this area actually need extra enforcement or can we move on to another complaint area and then go from there. Uh, we do keep track of all of our stats. Each time that we do perform a traffic stop, there is a form that has to be completed by the officer and it tracks uh, data all the way from the type of person we stop, violation, when, where, why. So yet, to answer your question, yes, we keep track of all of that. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and the devices you mentioned, uh, I think there's, well, what I've seen are the, the types of sort of mobile devices that demonstrate or, or show drivers what the speed posted speed limit is and what their speed is. And I wonder um, if there's any, if those are effective at all in reducing speeding without requiring, you know, officers to be present on the scene. Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? The types of devices? I do. I do. And the devices that I was actually speaking about are actually, I wouldn't call them concealed, but they're not the speed measuring devices that you would see where it says your speed is this, this is the speed limit. This is your speed. Right. I do think those are viable and I think they can be utilized in certain locations. And I do believe they can be helpful. Uh, but like as the captain mentioned, voluntary compliance is our ultimate goal. A lot right. of people I think actually want to do the right thing. So if they see a sign like that, that is helpful. But the signs that I was talking about are actually more of a concealed where we can actually gather that data without that bias of them seeing their speed being measured. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Um, I had been talking with uh, Captain Tomzak, uh, who I think works more in my area. Um, and he mentioned that those devices are, are kind of in short supply and there's a waiting list to have them deployed. And so I'm just wondering, as we're looking at, you know, how to spend the remaining funds from the American Rescue Plan, if there's a way to sort of put in a request for this type of equipment that is shown to reduce speeding without, you know, increasing on ongoing annual costs. You know, we're not, not able, I don't think, add positions with that funding, but if we can make a request for additional equipment that seems to be effective in getting people to engage in that voluntary compliance, I think that's something we ought to consider. Absolutely, sir. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. Sir, if I could add uh, just one more about uh, utilizing uh, data to really drive us. Uh, very recently, um, 
we received a complaint uh, and put out both the uh, the more uh, concealed speed measuring device because mm -hmm. uh, we did receive a complaint and we uh, we sent some officers out there and they just weren't they weren't simply able to substantiate the complaint based on what they were seeing. And after putting that uh, data box out there and going through everything that it recorded, uh, we found out this was more of an educational piece that the residents in that area were under the assumption it was a 25 mile an hour zone when in actuality it was a 35 mile an hour zone. And the reason they thought that was because there was a curve coming up and they had one of the yellow recommended signs that says 25, but that's not the actual speed limit. So that was the situation where we were able to uh, help out the residents and kind of educate them. And we also got them in, in touch with, because frankly, it was pretty tight in there to be 35. I'm not going, no need to sugarcoat it. And it was, it got a lot more volume of traffic because of a detour because of some road construction. So we still put one of those signs out there and it's exactly what you spoke of. It still accomplished what we wanted. It tended people to reach over and touch that brake pedal instead of the, the throttle, but we didn't have to allocate an officer out there. So then we could move them to somewhere else where we did have a substantiated speed complaint. So the, the data in a limited workforce that we all are dealing with, you know, we have to use our manpower the most efficiently we can to serve people the best we can. But that's a that's a perfect example of what you're speaking of of using one of those signs that flashed up your speed is in bright yellow, tends to slow people down a little bit. So we're able to accomplish what we wanted by trying to help out the citizens over there. But it wasn't necessarily because of officer there running radar during that time. Right. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain Gunner. Um, Captain Gunner, uh, Lieutenant White, Officer Morris. Thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna to have to cut off discussion here. The We have a full agenda tonight, but I want to thank you very much for attending our meeting. Hopefully we can hear from you in the past and my note taking and listening at the same time skills are not quite up to bar, but I think it was Lieutenant White that said that he would take our letter. Is that correct? Our, uh, our list of questions. Absolutely, right. I'll take care of that. Wonderful. And uh, so if anybody has any follow-up questions, please get in touch and we'll make sure we update that communication to cover your concerns. It's our honor to be here. Don't hesitate to reach out if you need us. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. That brings us up to the next presentation from Joseph Vasca, the Dix Park Night of Lights ride coming up this December. Uh, November and December, I believe. Oh, one second. And Joseph, you should be able to meet now. There you go. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'd like to White said, my name is Joseph Vasca. I work with the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Department. I am the Program and Operations Supervisor over at Dix Park. Um, I was asked to come and kind of give an update around Nights of Lights and specifically talk about the bike night of events that we'll be doing as part of Nights of Lights this year. I don't know who's controlling the screen, but can I say, like, next slide? All right, Barbara, next slide. <laughs> so, so just a few updates. I'm going to kind of talk assuming that everybody knows what Nights of Lights is. If you don't and you would like some more detailed information about Nights of Lights, let me know. But in very kind of general terms, Nights of Lights is a drive-through holiday light show that occurred at Dix Park last year for the first year. The city partnered with WRAL and Capital Broadcasting to provide the event, um, and this is going to be our second year of Nights of Lights. You'll see the date range there on the screen. We're starting the event earlier this year to address some of the traffic concerns that we had last year. So basically, we're going to be providing the event over more nights and reducing the amount of vehicles that will be going through the event this year. So we're actually cutting the vehicle count in half um, because of the first few nights we had some, like I said, some traffic issues, reduced those numbers, and we corrected that as the event went along. So what's new for 2021? Uh, one of the first things we're excited about is we're going to be doing a, a Nights of Lights 5K this year. So the first night of the event, November 20th, we'll be doing a walk run through the lights. That was requested last year. We couldn't do it due to COVID. 
what we feel like we can do it safely this year. We already have over 300 people signed up for that walk run that evening. So we're really excited about that and registrations just got it started. Second piece that's new this year is we had a huge response last year for bike night. So we decided to this year to dedicate two full nights of the Nights of Lights event to bikes. And we'll talk a little bit more detail about that in just a minute. Another piece we're adding is there's a dedicated VIP vehicle entrance this year. So last year we got some feedback that uh, regular kind of general emission vehicles and VIP vehicles were entering at the same place. So we worked out the event route, which I'll show you in just a minute, to have a different entrance for general emission vehicles and VIP vehicles. Like I talked about a minute ago, we've reduced the overall vehicle counts by half this year, just to make sure that we don't have some of the traffic congestion that we experienced at the beginning of the event. And then, like I said, we've we've made the start date of the event a little bit earlier this year than last year. The, in 2020, we didn't start the event until the second week of December. This year, we're starting um, the same weekend as the Christmas parade, just to allow more time for and more nights for vehicles and folks to enjoy the event. So, Barbara, you can go to the next slide. So just an overview of that timeline. Um, on November 20th, will be the Knights of Lights run and walk. The first bike night is on the 21st this year, which is a Sunday evening. Then we're going to take a few nights off because that's the week of Thanksgiving. Then our public vehicle nights begin on the 26th and go through Christmas Eve. And then we have our second night, bike night, on Monday, December 13th. So like I said, so in 2020, we kind of had a combination bike night, and then we had vehicles afterwards. Due to the high demand, we've dedicated two full nights of the events to bikes this year. So you can kind of see the, the um, timeline there. And actually, next week, the the installation of all the nights of the all the lights start in Dix Park. So if you can imagine, we've already got to start installing all the lights to make sure they're all in place by the twentieth. It, it's kind of crazy to me that the holidays are already here, so we're rocking and rolling on lights. Next slide, please, Barbara. So here's an idea of the route this year. So like I said, we've kind of come up with two different entrances for the event this year. This may be a little difficult to see, but I'll try to walk you through it. The red line at the top of the screen um, demonstrates where general emission vehicles are going to enter. So they're going to enter at the same place they did in 2020 off of Western Boulevard and come up to the intersection of Hunt Drive and, and Umstead Drive in Dix Park. And the VIP entrance for the event is going to be off of Lake Wheeler Road, coming through the park on Umstead Drive and meeting at the same location. So you'll see the yellow star is the official start of Nights of Lights this year. And then it's a 1.3 mile route through Dix Park, if you're familiar, over by the Flowers Cottage and Flowers Field and the Sunflower Field, where we have sunflowers. And then it's um, through a little bit of NC State property, who are being great partners with us for the event. And down by the Big Field, where we just had, um, if anybody heard or attended Falling for Local over the weekend, which half of Raleigh did, we had tons of people there, which was awesome. Um, but by, down by the Big Field and then down out Good Street near Healing Transitions. So that's the official route for the event this year. Barbara, you can go to the next slide. One of the things we really thought about, and like I said, with the, the bike night events was in responding to that demand is expanding to the two full nights dedicated to bikes this year. I kind of went over those dates earlier. Um, the way that it kind of works on those evenings, and I apologize, there's a typo there. That should be Sunday, November 21st. Don't want to confuse anybody with dates. Um, so the way that ticketing works for nights of lights for all nights is tickets are provided in 30 minute time slots. So starting at 6 p.m., you can buy a ticket at 6, 6.30, 7, 7.30, 8, 8.30, so on and so forth through 9.30 each night. There's still tickets available on both nights, but I can tell you we've already sold a lot of bike night tickets, which is very exciting. We have time slots on both nights that are already sold out, and then we have other nights that are other time slots that are very close to being sold out. So we're very excited about the response that we've had from the two nights. You can go to the next slide, Barbara. I know one of the questions was is, so how will bike night participants access the site? So one of the challenges that we had last year is on the Rocky Branch Trail, the Greenway Trail that goes in the front of the park, it is very dark down there. So we actually last year when folks participated in the bike night event, we had them park over where you can see those cars in front of the new renovated chapel um, where the two car symbols are on top of the parking lot. We had folks park there and then they would bike back down and bike that section of Rocky Branch Trail from where it says Tate Drive over to the Hunt Drive entrance. And we had some we had some security concerns from folks that were attending the event last year because it is very dark down in that area. So we tried to revisit and kind of rethink about how could we have bikes accessing the greenway be able to bike in, but also folks we saw a lot last year that people drove to the park parked with bikes on their vehicles and then wanted to unload bikes and then access the event. 
So we thought about that we're creating this VIP interest to the event this year, and we're going to utilize that for bike night access because that section over in that area of the park is much better lit than the Rocky Branch Greenway Trail area and then coming up Hunt Drive. Because the other option we'd have is if you're familiar with the park, they, there's the Old Castle soccer field area where we've actually allowed some of that to grow up because we had some play going on out there that um, was damaging some turf, et cetera. We could have parking there. But again, we run into the same issue over in that area with it being dark and there being no lights. So we wanted to be really safe for people. So I can't control the cursor, but I'm going to try to talk you through this. So on on that those bike nights, we're going to have everybody in our bar. We see where that gray um, marker is at Western Boulevard and Boylan Avenue kind of top. Yeah, right there. So that is the South Boylan Avenue entrance to Dix Park. That is where all bike night traffic will enter that evening. We will have every other entrance to the park closed that night. And we'll have Raleigh police personnel at those in, at those entrances. And we chose that entrance because not only is it close to the Greenway access, but it's also right up, we can go right up the hill in a really lit area to have vehicles come in as well. So if you follow the bike symbols that I put on the map, we will send all bikes up Boylan Avenue Keep going, Barbara. There it is. So all the way up to Umstead Drive, and then the bikes will make a right there and proceed down Umstead Drive towards the yellow star. See the yellow star, Barbara? Keep going to the left. So bikes will go all the way down. That will all be lit, So, and then folks will bike down that way. Bikes, can, if they're coming off the greenway, will be directed over onto Tate Drive. Excuse me, I said that wrong. Bikes are going up Boylan. Cars will come in off of Boylan Avenue and be directed up Tate Drive to access the large parking lot in front of the newly renovated chapel at Dix Park, where there's about 350 car parking spaces in that area. Cars will park there if they have bikes on the back of them, so then bikes can unload, and then they'll join that same path that folks coming off the Greenway will take over towards the Yellow Star and access the event there. So again, in hearing feedback last year that people felt were, were looking for kind of a better solution of how to park, making sure it was safe, we really took a look, looked at the site at night, wanted to make sure it was safe, and that's how we plan to have folks enter the park to access the bike night event. So then once you're on your bike, you'll come to the Yellow Star area, you'll do your ticketing and check in there, and then you'll proceed on the 1.3 mile loop um, through the park. And for bike night, you actually get a special, special treat because you get to bike all the way down and then back to the entrance, which cars do not get to do. So you actually get to go 2.6 miles down and back. So you have that, that 30 minute time window to kind of explore the um, lit route for the event. Then you come back, you either go back on the greenway if you bike to the park or back to your vehicle and your exit. So that's the plan for bike night this year. Like I said, we're so excited that we were able to work in two full nights of bikes for the event. We're also very excited we're gonna have the 5K this year. And folks, the word is out because we have, like I said, we've had a lot of tickets sold already. So wanted to provide an update to this group about this exciting new addition to Knights of Lights this year, the additional bike um, ticketing and time options. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the event or about bike night specifically. Thank you very much, Mr. Vasca. Uh, Commissioner Gellenbeck, I see your hand. I'll get you in just a second. First, I would like to recognize Vice Chair Neptune and Commissioner McLean, who have joined the meeting. So do those introductions and back to you, Mary Jo. Thank you, Mr. Otwell. Yes, I'm very excited by all the updates and news. Congratulations. Um, and I wanted to ask you about bike nights entry points. You had mentioned, I think I over, I think I heard you say that there's going to be one entrance for people who are biking to Dix Park and that'll be at the Boylan South Boylan Avenue, is that what the, the entrance is on? And that's the only place that you can enter as a bike rider? So that's the, for us to make sure that we kind of have staff and security in the same place, and that's right off the greenway, we want all of the bikes to, bikes to come through that entrance so we can make sure everybody gets to the ticketing point correctly. So yes, so, we're gonna be pointing out all the bikes that way this year. Okay, um, the reason why um, I wanted to, question that location is because of the topography there is um, not as easy as Hunt Drive, is it? Um, which is a much easier uh, road to cycle up versus the other ones that you've selected. And if bike night is for bikes, is it, it's for dedicated bike, bike riders only, no vehicles will be there? 
That's correct. The only vehicles that will come in are folks that load bikes on their vehicles and then unload to participate on their bike. So why not choose the uh, hunt drive, just like the vehicle traffic is using, and offer that parking lot off a of hunt drive for people who are arriving with their bicycles uh, by a vehicle, and then have the traffic go up hunt drive, which is an easier incline for people. Issue, and we evaluated that. The challenge we heard last year was safety in that area. It is extremely dark over there in the evening in that parking lot area and coming up Hunt Drive. And since the int since the event is now starting all the way at the end of Hunt Drive at the intersection of Hunt and Umstead, it's going to be dark over there. So the concern that came up last year with some folks that entered off of Hunt Drive is there are limited street lights over in that area, and there were concerns about safety in that area. So that's why we decided to move to the Boylan Street in the South Boylan Street Avenue entrance because there's much better lighting in that area. We did evaluate the topography too because it's a little bit of an uphill ride up that hill, but that's why we evaluated and wanted to make sure it was a safe environment for everybody that was coming to experience the event. Um, do we have, do we readily have um, street, uh, temporary street lighting that can be put into that uh, parking lot area and Hunt Drive? Is that the concern, the lighting on the property itself or the, right? So it's not, so do we have something of that nature? And the reason why I'm really stressing my curiosity or why my curiosity is really peaked is because I, as a bicycle rider I, and an older bicycle rider, <laughs> topography is very important to me uh, as it is for people who are traveling with kids and uh, their with the added weight of a child on your bicycle or the child is on their bike alone. That topography, even though it might be well lit, is not really the best environment to cycle on, either going up or going down, um, and, and, and if it's at night. And the hunt drive is so wide and so open and it's such a nice, uh, comfortable ride. I, I really would prefer that versus the ones that you guys are considering as a bike can, from my experience. Yeah, we can definitely take that feedback and go look at it again. It's a, if you're familiar with Hunt Drive, which it sounds like you are, it's a pretty long road. So it would, it would take a, a, a decent amount of light because you've probably seen them at like construction sites, like the temporary light towers. So that's what we use to like light the ticketing areas and things of that nature. So it would take a good amount of light towers to really light that. But I'm happy to take that feedback back and evaluate that again to see if that's something we can take a look at it. Because your topography point is a really good one. And we thought about that one as well. So happy to evaluate that okay. and see if we can, we can look at that solution. Thank you so much. I appreciate you that. You're welcome. And uh, I'll recognize you in just a second, Commissioner Thomas. We need to be moving on from this item to stick to our agenda. So let's, uh, the commissioners, please keep your comments on this one to a minimum. Um, Commissioner yeah. Thomas. Sure, will do. I just want to uh, agree with uh, Commissioner Gallenbeck. That looks to be from Western Boulevard uh, up to Umstead Drive on South Boylan, looks to be about a 50 foot elevation gain in just over two tenths of a mile. So that's a significant hill on a bike. That's not an e bike. What is it on uh, Hunt Drive? Can you do that real quick, Mr. Thomas? And while you do your math, uh, Commissioner Hester. I just wondered if there was a requirement for entrance to bike night or any other sort of suggestions. <laughs> I hope you all could hear me. My internet is. Not I was breaking great. up. Would you mind repeating the question, please? Sorry. I just wanted, I wanted to ask about helmet requirements. Is there a helmet requirement for people entering the bike night event? There's not a helmet requirement. It was recommended last year, but there's not a requirement. Uh, Commissioner Thomas. Looks like that's 39 feet over four tenths of a mile on Hunt Drive. Okay. So that's that's a significant difference, I think. That's deep. We can def we'll definitely evaluate that again. I really appreciate that feedback. We'll, de we'll definitely take it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Otwell, I know you want to rush on, um, but I really, this is important too. And I was hoping that we could uh, partner with Citric Cycle and have a virtual station added uh, Citric Cycle bikes at the site um, near the parking lot would be really 
awesome addition to uh, people's comfort level to arrive by vehicle and then the bikes are there for them. That's it. We've already had some conversation with Mary Sell and Michelle Hood about some of those opportunities. So we've already started some of that conversation. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner Gellin back there was very brief. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think that I see any more questions, so I'm going to move right along quickly. Uh, Mr. Vasca, thank you very much. I already have my tickets. I bought a block of tickets so that if anybody of my friends needs some help getting to the event and one of them sells out, get in touch with me. Uh, thanks for your time and look thanks for the opportunity. To... Yeah, thank you very much. Have, have a wonderful evening. You too. Okay, next up on the agenda, we're only a few minutes behind, so I think we should still take our five minute break. Let's come back at seven.
think you made the right choice personally, but you, you did manage to miss the Raleigh Police Department and their discussion. <laughs> and, uh, I would like to let everybody know how much Mr. Neptune has been working and persistent in making sure that we make that connection and get them to our meetings. So I knew you'd be disappointed when I. When I, I am, but I, I'm glad to know I can look back at the uh, the recording once it's posted. Absolutely. I believe we just hit quorum again. So let's keep rolling then. Do we need to do anything official with it? Not after the, the break. Okay. Um, after the break, next up, we would like to welcome back Ms. Fontaine Burress with the Lake Wheeler. Is this the uh, edge study update or is this the, uh, it's the Lake Wheeler update? So this is in response to the uh, previous question from uh, Commissioner Thomas about coordination of all the activities along Lake Wheeler Road. Um, there's a lot that's happening right now, basically between South Saunders Street and um, uh, I 40 interchange and a lot of things that the city has been coordinating uh, a lot of moving parts out there. And so uh, Fontaine Burris from my office is going to give you an update on that. So Eric summed it up pretty well, but um, Fontaine Burris with transportation, um, giving you kind of an update on essentially what's taking place in the overall corridor, the multiple projects that are currently going on. Uh, next slide. So um, as Eric said, this is a pretty busy area at the moment. There's a lot happening and a lot changing in the area. Um, starting to the north, we have uh, the Western Boulevard BRT route. Um, that runs along Western Boulevard and the overpass where um, South Saunders is. Um, that just did the West, they just completed the Western Boulevard corridor plan. Um, adjacent to that, we have uh, Park City South and another large rezoning that is occurring um, along Hamel Drive. Uh, that Hamel Drive is rezoning, is currently pending, um, but if it moves forward, it would um, be similar in size to Park City South. Um, we also have the Dix Park Plaza in play that has just finished the design process. It's at 100% design um, and is going to be moving forward with permitting and construction. Um, and then we also have some improvements that are being made as part of healing transitions, um, just adjacent to plaza and play. At the same time, we thought we've also had the Dix Edge study that is um, currently ongoing. Uh, it's making recommendations to the uh, street network there and making some additions to the street plan. It has also made a recommendation for a custom streetscape along Lake Wheeler Road, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a moment. And then at the southern end of the corridor, we have the State Farmers Market, which is adding a new driveway entrance, which will include sidewalks. So it'll be um, a great pedestrian entrance into the Farmers Market. There is a complete streets implementation program project just south of there that will be adding a multi-use path that runs from Centennial to the driveway, um, the farmer's market driveway entrance to allow for bike access into the farmer's market. And there is also an NCDOT project taking place at the intersection of Centennial and Lake Wheeler that is going to be adding an additional turn lane. So there'll be two turn lanes onto Centennial and then one through lane um, going along Lake Wheeler. It is also um, adding some pedestrian updates as well to improve crossings there. In addition, we have the Maywood Ave sidewalk project that's gonna be adding sidewalks along Maywood Avenue. 
So a lot going on. Um, I do want to talk a little bit more about the Lake Wheeler Road Improvement Project that is a newer project stemming off of the work uh, done through the Dix Edge study and kind of helping to tie all of these projects together. Next slide. So this project is going to be focused on the corridor between South Saunders and Maywood. Um, in addition to making updates to the road, it's also going to be adding bike, pedestrian, bike and pedestrian improvements as well as intersection improvements. Next slide. This is the preferred cross section selected as part of the Dix Edge study. So it's going to be keeping Lake Wheeler as two lanes, um, but going to be adding a center median. Um, I do want to note that that median width has not been determined at this point. Um, it's going to be affected by what intersections, intersection treatments get selected um, for the corridor. It's going to, on the park side, it's going to include a 10 foot sidewalk, a 10 foot a median median amenity space um, and a 12 foot two way bike facility that's raised in behind curb on the neighbor residential side it's going to include a six foot um, green space and then six foot sidewalks. Next slide. There are some constraints that were kind of balancing along the corridor with this project. Um, one is integrating kind of everything that's currently happening in all those projects that I mentioned earlier. And we're also aiming to minimize impacts on the residential side. So we're gonna be taking any right of way needed from the park side. However, on the park side, we do have some constraints as well. We have some large transmission lines um, which are very expensive to move. And we also have some historic buildings. Um, so we are trying to navigate fitting that great cross section into the corridor, keeping in mind these constraints. And I do wanna mention that um, we have funding for design, but do not yet have funding for construction. So there's not a um, current construction date. Slide. We are currently in the pre-design process, which is looking at selecting those intersection treatments. It's going to finalize the cross section. And then we are also having a um, virtual open house that will be opening in the next week or so um, to get public feedback on those intersection treatments. Once that is completed, uh, it's going to go into full design, which is going to be led by engineering services. Um, and that's going to be looking at things like utilities coordination, the full design, grading, stormwater, et cetera. There will be an additional public touch point during that phase as well. Next slide. So like I said, um, these are the intersections that we're looking at. Uh, some of the treatments that we're considering include roundabouts, um, restricting left turns, so doing right in, right out only intersections at some locations, and also some signalized intersections. Um, once those are determined, it will finalize the cross section and kind of help us determine that median width. And like I said, there's a virtual open house happening, um, hoping to have that open middle of next week. And we will also be having a um, live Q&A session as part of that. Next slide. This is our schedule. Um, we're currently, like I said, in the pre-design phase. The Dix Edge study still needs to go to council. So that will be going to council later this fall for council review. And then um, it will also be adopted shortly after that. Uh, Meanwhile, engineering services is going to be advertising for design consultant and um, selecting one to award the design contract. After that, they'll start 
the full design uh, with a public touch point estimated middle of summer 2022 with a construction date still to be determined pending um, additional funding for construction. Next slide. We do have a project page. Um, this is the link. You can also do a keyword search for Lake Wheeler Road Improvement Project. Um, we will be posting information. There's, this site is currently live, but we will also be posting information about the virtual open house in the coming week. And that concludes my presentation. What questions can I answer? <clears throat> oh, thank you very much, Mr. Burris. Uh, oh, excuse me, oh. Ms. Burris. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to do tech and talk at the same time, <laughs> and I can't. Um, anyway, on to Mr. Commissioner Thomas, who has a question. Thank you, and, and thank you, Fontaine and Eric, so much for putting that together. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Um, the the citizen concerns that initially um, got my questions going were specifically around uh, the, the intersection of Centennial and Lake Wheeler, and so it looks like that's an NCDOT project there. And so I'm wondering if there's a a way that I can get more information on that. Is it, is that something that's easily searchable on their website or? I'm happy to send you some information and the most current plans that I've seen for that intersection. Okay, thank you. That'd be wonderful. Um, and do we know what the, the farmer's market driveway entrance? I, I don't think I've seen a sort of final plan for what ultimately that's going to look like. I think at some point it was supposed to be a right turn out only, um, but that didn't work with the city maybe. It's, again, is there a, a way I can kind of see the final plan there? Yeah, and if there's a way to pull the PowerPoint back up, I actually have a slide that shows um, at least the most recent plans that I have seen. Okay, I know we're on a tight schedule, yeah. so I'll just might. Um, I if we want to keep going through questions, we'll yeah, I'll it up. The, the final question I had is just a, the point I wanted to make is that. There, there's obviously a tremendous amount of coordination needed here to make all of these uh, projects work together in a small space. And so I hope that the, the, the small transition areas between, you know, this is our project, this is their project, et cetera. I hope we think about those transition areas so that the whole area operates effectively as a whole and that we don't have these sort of unforeseen difficult areas for people walking and people biking. So I just want to I hope we can emphasize integration of the various projects. And Mr. Thomas, that's exactly why the, the city intervened in the, the manner that we did. And we appreciate the, the Department of Agriculture being willing to hold up their project to allow for this coordination. I mean, 50% of the job that my office plays is air traffic control <laughs> and making sure that all the parts fit together. And this is a situation that we, we suddenly determined there are multiple initiatives that were all happening pretty separate from each other. So that's what we've been working to do is herd the cats and bring everyone together. And uh, you can see the plans on the screen right now in terms of what's been, been integrated. Um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Fontaine can certainly keep me straight, uh, that the new driveway will be a full movement uh, intersection and allow for access. And I believe the ultimate goal is to move towards signalizing this intersection. Um, so it's yeah. a, a lot of coordination that we've had for this. That is correct. Um, part of one of the intersection or the intersection treatment that we're really looking at for Maywood Ave as part of the Lake Wheeler project is signalizing that intersection um, and adding improved pedestrian crossings there. All right, great, thank you. And the proposed speed limit through this corridor is it? Because I think right now it's 35 through there, and I, I hope we're going to think about going down to 25. I believe the intent right now is just to remain at 35. Um, we've not had any conversations. Obviously, what we're building into the design conversations about the Lake Wheeler project and by introducing you know, potentially roundabouts with intersection controls would, would lower the operating speed significantly. Okay. Is the, the the challenge further south on Lake Wheeler is that you know you've got the I-40 interchange, and so I think people coming off of I-40 there 
oftentimes feel like they're still on an interstate and they, they, it needs to be the real clear that you're moving to a bit much different transportation environment as you come off I-40 there. Yeah, and the, and the break point really is going to be the Centennial uh, Parkway intersection because once you once you pass that threshold, the constraints will kick in now with the changes that DOT has proposed at that intersection that gets reinforced with these changes and reinforced with subsequent CIP projects. So those those things are all going to contribute to a significant change in character. Um, differentiating part of the conversation earlier this evening about police and signs and radar. What we intend to do is to build in those characteristics into the, the base design of the facility right. to create that feel and nonverbal communication to the user of being in a different place. Right, right. Well, thank you both again. Those are all the, the questions I had, so I really appreciate it. I saw Commissioner Gellenbeck and then Commissioner Caruso. Mm, thank you, Mr. Otwell. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I've seen on Lake Wheeler. Um, several people waiting for the bus uh, go raleigh service and i just want to hope that that is also included in the design that the the, the station will be made for them and it'll be oh, yeah. Uh, yeah okay great yeah I, i've seen dozens of people actually waiting with nothing there but a a, a, a chain link fence <laughs> yes um and transit improvements are definitely going to be made as part of it also, it's currently it, a one directional service. So there's been a recommendation made through the Dick's Edge study to make it a bi directional service. Um, I don't know if there's plans to move forward with that recommendation at this time, but it's something that we're taking into account when we're um, doing the design. Thank you, Ms. Burris. Commissioner Caruso. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just want to say that, I mean, while the designs are obviously quite preliminary, I mean, what you've shown so far looks very promising for Lake Wheeler. I think that was certainly, especially compared to what's out there now, will be a significant improvement um, to that whole area and corridor. Um, I had a specific question about the sidewalk project on Maywood Avenue. Um, I, was, I was curious how, how far along that project is in design or is construction imminent or, or or what's the timeline on that? Um, my question is mainly because I know currently we have uh, painted bike lanes on Maywood and if we're doing some type of capital project and it's not imminent, maybe we can look at, you know, either moving out the curb and doing a multi-use path or some type of behind the curb facility if we're already going through and doing a, a capital project in the area. So I believe that Maywood sidewalk project is currently in right of way acquisition um, and they are going to advertise for construction later this fall. Okay. Um, and the, um, the intersection of South Saunders and Lake Wheeler, it, I know that was kind of part of the overall Lake Wheeler corridor plan thing um, is is the current intent is that going because like the way it kind of juts out and comes back is that going to be constructed by that private development or is that still going to or is the city going to be doing that construction at some point in the future there's some uh negotiation right now happening between the city and the developer of who's going to um take on that work but it is written into the lake wheeler project scope to do the, to implement the new the street plan and do that intersection reconfiguration so that Lake Wheeler would be the primary um, movement when you're driving south. So there's Lake Wheeler and South Saunders in our street plan calls for the realignment of that intersection to create more of a, a T intersection. Um, this project would move forward with doing the design for that. The good news is that having this on part of our comprehensive plan allows us to coordinate with the developer to, if nothing else, protect that footprint that we need and work on making sure that any building footprints that they're planning for their project won't interfere with our ability to make the corrections to the intersection that we need. And, and just for everyone's clarification here, 
what we're referring to is realigning the intersection of Lake Wheeler to make it the dominant movement with South Saunders Street, and then making that portion of, of South Saunders T into that. So um, um, I think the reality is between that and some other development we have had in the street, we'll probably be looking for developer dedications and set asides for easements and such that would allow the city to come in and cohesively put everything together rather than try and piecemeal it with different developers. It, and I just had a quick follow up while we're talking in that area. Um, I know there's, I know the comp plan or the street plan um, recommends basically creating a T intersection at South Saunders and McDowell Dawson. It, is that, is that still like long ways away or does that fit in with this visioning at all? Or is that still like a pie in the sky type of operation? Cause that's, I assume going to be a quite significant construction project it would be um, there's been some interest expressed by the development team that's working on park city south because that change to that intersection directly abuts their development um, and it's, it's difficult to go into detail without having some maps but effectively hamill drive would be extended and make a complete east-west section between lake wheeler road and dawson mcdowell where we currently have that leftover signal that provides the access into South Saunders. And so that whole area would be reconfigured. And what it would do is actually free up some of the existing public right of way, either for public open space or for some redevelopment options. And so there's been some interest expressed by the Park City South team and working with NCDOT and with the city on accomplishing that. So the short answer is no, it is not high in the sky. It has, it has some legs and uh, we're exploring options currently. Okay, thank you. And I believe I saw Commissioner Alley with her hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm saying that this is a, um, a public project, just an encouragement to think about um, future redevelopment along that west side of Lake Wheeler Road, which I think is proposed to all be upzoned almost in its entirety. Um, so while we certainly don't want to have undue uh, right away takes from existing homeowners, I would imagine almost the entirety of that time is just going to change the thinking about what it's going to look like when we get this full uh, multi-use um, street section codified and uh, and on the ground and and specifically what it will look like for that to happen incrementally on a road that has a capital project planned for it. So I'm not sure what the solution will be, but I would make sure to write that into your scope <laughs> for whoever gets hired to, to think through those awkward kind of uh i guess the adolescent growth phase <laughs> of this street as it goes from having no facilities to having duplicate ones to evening out to the full preferred section yes i we definitely agree and that's something that we've been having some internal conversations with us how do we anticipate that and Adjustments, adjustments if needed to the design. That's great. I also, I think, you know, you have constraints on um, the park side as well, but I would caution against kind of kicking the can to the other side of the street um, if something of that might be, because it is, um, we need it to be fully bi-directional. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Alley. Are there any more questions? Wonderful. Well, Ms. Burris, thank you very much. It's wonderful to see you at our meetings again. Um, good luck. Is uh, How many agencies are involved in this? How many departments and agencies? And <laughs> on that one map you had to show us, if you had to guess, like how many of the different directors are, are involved in that? In the Lake Wheeler Improvement Project itself, there's just maybe six. Okay. Um, there's a lot of coordination, as Eric said. Our group is trying to play traffic control and just keep keep track of everything that's happening and keep all the stakeholders and those with projects in the area involved. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a live moving corridor at this moment. Um, but we, we're really excited about the potential and about this project and think we'll make a big improvement um, to the corridor. 
Well, it looks very exciting. Thank you very much. And um, I will, once we have information about that virtual um, open house for the project, I will um, have that information shared with the commission. And I definitely encourage all to um, take a look. There will also be a survey where we're asking for the public's feedback. Wonderful. Make sure we get that information out. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I believe this moves us on to the very last presentation of the night. This should not take very long. Um, this uh, is just a quick opportunity for us to discuss. I'd like to send to the planning committee a discussion uh, to add Navajo Drive to the bike plan. And so if you're not familiar with it, it's a little road that is in the street plan to run from Midtown East all the way up to Dartmouth Road or in the vicinity thereof through the Midtown East uh, development. And it looks like a good opportunity. And Mr. Paul Black and I have discussed it a couple of times and think that the, the planning committee or the uh, probably the planning committee is the place to send that. And uh, if anybody would like to discuss that, happy to have a quick talk. Otherwise, we can just dispense with it and move on to the next item on the agenda. So I'll go ahead and move that we send that to the planning committee. Commissioner Thomas seconds all in favor. Opposed. Thank you and we'll get that on the agenda coming up soon. All right, next up we move into reports. I will keep my chair's report very brief. Uh, I didn't bring my meetings notes from my last meeting with uh, Councilman Milton, so I'll table that till next month and follow up at that point. But please, if you have questions, get them to us and we'll make sure that gets into the next meeting. Uh, we had a meeting, Commissioner Vice Chair Neptune and I got together with uh, Nathan Spencer from the Raleigh Transit Authority and we started having a discussion about uh, RTA's role in transportation planning and how BPAC can interact as part of our discussion about exploring BPAC's place and looking at uh, the roles of all the different committees and boards and how they work together to form a to form a whole for the, our transportation planning environment. Um, that is the end of my chair's report and we can move on to committee reports. And let's start with, we can start with planning and uh, Commissioner Tong and I can knock this one back and forth. We had a good discussion about six forks and I'll let Pierre, I'll let you start while I dig out my notes and then uh, we'll, we'll hit knock it back and forth. Sounds good. Um, Chad Cantrell came to the planning committee and presented on the six forks uh, widening project. And um, we had a couple points of discussion, mostly focused on the end of the corridor. Um, at the southern end, we talked about where the separated bike lane ends, and right now it is ramped into the street. So um, we did ask for consideration to tie that with the sidewalk as well to give multiple options. Uh, we talked about Rowan Street, which is included with the project, and we asked for a consideration of a multi-use path um, since it is included in the current bike plan. And lastly, the last major point I remember is at the other end at Six Forks and Lynn Road, we asked that a protected intersection be also considered there um, since it is along with, since there are protected intersections at the other intersections along the corridor. And that's what I've got, Dwight, what else do you have? Uh, that covers all the main points I wanted to get at. So I, I think we could leave it at that. The We brought this item to the planning committee so that we could take a detailed look at these six forks plans and get some of the questions and discussions out of the way so that when it came time to bring it back to the full commission, we didn't have to have a hour and a half long discussion like we had in the planning committee. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lamb, do you have a comment? Mr. Tong, if I just do the clarification, uh, where exactly was the committee requesting a multi-use path being included? Uh, along the range street between the proposed roundabout and six forks road, um, that block by the school. Along Rowan, adjacent to the school. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, th I believe we asked for a multi-use path or whatever consideration they could give 
with within the scope of the project uh, given the i think the bike lane the bike plan calls for a bike lane for part of that portion and then for the next portion down to the final spot on rowan it calls for a neighborhood bikeway and so they he was going to take a look at making that uh uh, line um, up. And I know again, we've deferred this item to the, the November meeting. Uh, right. Just one thing I will make the commission aware of, it's, and, and it's especially acute with the Six Forks Road project. We're having this problem on all of our projects, um, but um, we are a very successful market, um, which is um, the unintended effect of that is it's substantially driving up our real estate costs. Um, we're already dealing with a significant amount of con increased construction costs. And so one of the things that we're working with our engineering services team on is how to deal with those escalating costs relative to the amount of money that we have available from our, our transportation funding sources. Um, and that is a, a very tough discussion right now. So there, there may be, especially on the Six Forks project, just to make the commission aware, there may be some elements of value engineering that we have to go through on the project. I haven't determined what that would be yet. Um, but for example, asking for an extra, like a multi-use path along the way in, we may not be able to consider it just simply because of cost considerations. We are we are in, in tight quarters right now. So I just wanna make sure the commission understands that dynamic as we go into these discussions going forward. Uh, thank you for the heads up, Mr. Lamb. But yes, uh, I will collect my notes and we can send this out. So the notes that we took to the commissioners, so you can read over some of the minutes from our planning committee meeting before the next full meeting when Mr. Cantrell will come back and present uh, a briefer version of the Six Forks plan and uh, any responses he was able to make to our previous comments. And I think that up next we will have uh mr caruso with the policy meeting report sure thank you um yeah so th so this month we um kind of started a dialogue going over kind of the intersection of how we handle um the implementation of our bike and ped plans and kind of bike and ped facilities in general kind of in relation to uh, new development, both through kind of large scale plan development, zoning cases, and just larger scale development in general, um, and kind of how those two interplay, um, and and basically just trying to figure out how we can best make sure that we get the best facilities that we can. Um, there's been kind of a number of Kind of ongoing comments and concerns, both from within the commission members and from the general public, that as develop as some development projects come in, there's some confusion on like why certain th why certain things were done a certain way and kind of what facilities we should be expecting and and things like that. So so we so this month we had a, a very good conversation with uh, Jason Harden from. Uh, planning department and Jason Myers from transportation and we kind of started to step through um, kind of understanding from the from the planning side and development services side how they think about um, kind of translating the overall UDO and our code kind of translating that into specific site plans and things of that nature um, I, I personally have quite a number of notes and things to follow up on. I'm sure uh, Dwight does as well. There, there's certainly a lot to continue to work on and go forward on. And um, I'm sure there will be a, a number of follow up items and continuing conversations um, in that area. So that should be it for now. More to come. Thank you. Commissioner Caruso, that covers everything that I had in my notes. I believe this will be an ongoing discussion that we will not report out of that committee quite yet. So, uh, but if anybody would like to participate in that conversation, it's really fascinating. So we welcome, welcome more folks. 
And then we have Vice Chair Neptune with the Outreach Committee. Thank you, Mr. Otwell. Uh, well, as many of you know, it's been a great month for outdoor healthy activity, uh, given that it is in fact Walktober. Uh, and we've been uh, enjoying a great turnout with all of our various uh, Walktober related events and commitments, uh, you know, not least of which was, of course, our centerpiece uh, this month, uh, Stroll in the Streets. And I just want to say, you know, uh, briefly here, because I, you know, many of you know I could speak at length about it just in terms of how great it was. Um, you know, just a lot of folks to thank. Thank you to uh, all of our commissioners who were able to make it out. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Commissioner Gellenbeck for all of her work in leading and facilitating uh, the traffic garden at Chavis Park. I mean, I was a witness, my friends, to Ms. Gellenbeck, you know, walking through, instructing, guiding kids of all ages through this large traffic garden, uh, not unlike one that I myself learned how to ride a bike through, okay, you know, some years ago. Um, and it was just, it was a great sight to see uh, I, in fact, ran into Congresswoman Deborah Ross, uh, who specifically commented on our work, you know, saying uh, how deeply grateful she is for what we're doing here on the ground, as she's, you know, clearly advocating for more funding to support, you know, what we want to see in terms of investments in our pedestrian cycling and just, you know, general transportation infrastructure. Uh, I'd like to give another special thanks, frankly, to our city staff uh, from transportation through uh, our police department, parks and recreation planning, the urban design folks. Um, so many people came together to pull this off. And I think, you know, just from, from the text messages that I've been receiving from the friends and family that I ran into uh, all throughout the afternoon, um, I mean, it was so, so, so thoroughly enjoyed uh, by people of all ages and backgrounds. And in particular, I'm hearing from a lot of folks who, you know, are, are, have recently moved to the city of Raleigh and found this to be such a great opportunity to get to know people, get to meet people, get to meet folks with the city to get, you know, kind of learn more about what's going on. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the stroll in the streets has a real uh, opportunity, the real potential to, to become sort of a annual welcome to Raleigh sort of a, a event. Uh, and I, I hope that, uh, you know, we embrace it as such. Um, as a great occasion to just get together and, and, and see some, you know, you know, friends and family and, and welcome new folks, you know, into our community. Um, there's, of course, a lot going on as it relates to outreach and engagement, but Walktober is certainly the dominant theme for this month. And I, I suppose I'll hold tight on commenting on what's left. But, um, you know, in terms of outreach and engagement, it has been a very, very active month. And again, just bottom line is grateful for everybody who's come together to pull off all these events. I should mention Oaks and Spokes, of course, uh, and uh, our uh, executive director, Mary Sell, former commissioner, Mary Sell, who's done so much behind the scenes to support all of her various city staff teams and pulling off the pop-up bike lanes and, and uh, engagement opportunities. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, there are just countless numbers of vendors and volunteers who came through to support, you know, the events as well. So bottom line is, you know, it, it's been a phenomenal month and uh, it's, it's been so awesome to see so many residents and folks from our city uh, come together to celebrate and enjoy, you know, our, our pedestrian and cycling activity or uh, uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, Nick, I'd just like to interject that I don't want you to forget about the White Cane event last Friday evening with former uh, Commissioner uh, Reverend uh, Robert Parrish, and it was a really great event. Um, uh, Really, a, a wonderful event working with the, Nor the North Carolina Federation of the Blind. Um, I really encourage everybody to make sure to attend that. They plan to make it an annual event. Ms. Hatchell, thank you so much for that reminder. Uh, you know, a part of the challenge for me is that there's so much going on. I want to speak to all of it, honestly, but I don't want to take up 30 minutes of, uh, of our time. Uh, but it really it was a phenomenal event. Uh, former Commissioner uh, uh, Reverend Parrish in fact, led me through a, uh, a walk where, you know, I, you know, I closed my eyes and I learned how to, you know, be, um, to be guided properly. Uh, and, um, but then of course we had the walking tour, uh, the, the white cane tour around the city. And it was, uh, it was a great, great afternoon, which, which of course actually followed the walk and bike safety summit 
um, organized by our planning and development department um, at which you know I was I was kindly invited to to you know share some thoughts at uh, but the real highlight was uh, Angie Smith author of right of way um, race class and the silent epidemic of pedestrian deaths in America and her talk which I thought was terrific uh, and then all of that was followed by some very uh, active productive conversation around what we could do uh, to further invest uh, in a cleaner more walkable and bikeable city so uh, again thank you uh, Commissioner Hatchell for that reminder about um, our white cane safety day which which too should become another annual event uh, celebrating and acknowledging our pedestrian infrastructure and the improvements uh, that we can make to it. Thank you very much, Mr. Neptune. Uh, let me add, I should have added this as part of my chair's report. So let me go back and add tomorrow. We will be presenting the letter that we have composed and voted on uh, about the New Bern BRT corridor. So that is on the agenda for city council tomorrow, and I will be presenting a brief summary of it. And the full letter is included in their agenda packet. So, quick amendum to the chair's report. And I believe that covers all the committees. Did I get all the committees? I believe so. Moving on, then we will come to staff reports. And Mr. Lamb, if you would kick it off for us, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, clearly, 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 a lot going on. Uh, as we've entered the fall, we're, we're not sitting on our laurels. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank everybody that worked on the uh, the stroll on the streets event uh, yesterday. I got a lot of really positive feedback about that. Um, I especially want to thank some folks that are not on the call, and that is our 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 co our coworkers in the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Department, who actually took the lead on this event in terms of the overall event staging. And our portion focused primarily on the street revisioning section. So we really want to thank them for stepping up. You know, uh, we've been talking about the idea of an open streets event in Raleigh for quite some time. Uh, so it's it's terrific to see it finally come together in a way that can be done and manageable. The next step of this is to really be thinking about now that we've established this idea from this corridor, the real trick is what can we do for the implementation? And I'm, I'm laying the groundwork for here as my charge to the commission and time, my time is short with the city. Um, but this is, uh, uh, the important part is it's the, the feel good events are all great. But now comes the, the, the tough part, which is figuring out how to the doing the doing part. So I, I really am excited to see what, what comes out of this type of uh, event from a momentum standpoint, what we can accomplish. Um, a couple of council updates for everyone. So, uh, the city council approved the, um, amendments to the city code for, uh, um, the cross sections that the commission had approved there were some modifications as we went through the process. I want to thank everyone for their time they spent on that. Uh, we really want to thank uh, folks from the development community that stepped in and gave us a lot of feedback uh, and, and worked through a lot of the details. And this is literally a negotiation of inches at the end of the day in terms of how we fit these things together. Um, I really do feel like this is a, a landmark piece of, of code as it relates to cities. Um, not a lot of other cities in the United States have built in this type of bike infrastructure into their base code. And so that is a, a pretty you know, landmark move on our part, I believe. So I'm excited to see, uh, as I'll be watching from the sidelines, as far as the implementation goes. I um, also want to uh, recognize that the term of Mr. Otwell, uh, Mr. Otwell was uh, appointed for his uh, third and final term at the last council meeting. So. Uh, glad you're in for the long haul, sir. Um, I also want to share that uh, Ms. Hester, I believe that this will be your last meeting with us as uh, Ms. Hester indicated that she would not be seeking reappointment from city council and city council offered nominations at their last meeting. And so uh, we will likely have a vote at the next meeting uh, tomorrow. If not, it'll be in two weeks. And so at that point, Ms. Hester's term on the commission would, would uh, end. And so we want to thank you so much for your time with us and your commitment to the commission and the work you've done here. And we hope we have the opportunity to have a social at some point and thank you for your service. So thank you very much. Um, at this point, I will pass it along to Mr. Black. All right. So first item up, uh, our resurfacing program and standalone markings program for the bike uh, side of things are moving along at pace. 
Uh, a number of the resurfacing projects are already completed. Uh, there is one of our uh, neighborhood bikeway projects still outstanding, uh, and that is up in Eric's old neighborhood. Got it pulled up here. It's we are still waiting for the uh, Bright Haven Falls River project. I have not been up to inspect it, but it's still showing up as uh, under construction. Uh, we have one of our restriping existing lanes. Uh, Brookside is complete. Peace is still pending. And uh, our new bike lanes, Green Road is complete. Brentwood, the uh, uh, preliminary markings are in, but the final markings are not. And they are continuing to tweak the intersection with Raleigh Boulevard. Um, that has been problematic for car traffic backing up. Um, so we're continuing to play around with exactly how that's going to work. Uh, the irony there is we were really worried about the intersection with Capitol Boulevard, and that's where the design team spent most of their time making sure we wouldn't back traffic up. And that turned out to not be the issue. <laughs> Either that or we did a really great job so that it wasn't an issue, uh, but we needed to give Raleigh Boulevard a little more time. The, the good um, news on that one is the city's traffic control center is actually right at that intersection. So those guys can literally look out the window and, and try and tune the, 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 the traffic signal. But unfortunately, because of the shift in the lanes, and the work we did at the intersection actually is going to require reconfiguration of the traffic signal heads to meet legal standards. And so that has a lag. And unfortunately, that lag is, puts us in an interim period where that, that signal will not function as optimally as it should. So, uh, but I, I want to thank my team for fielding a few angry phone calls over that. But for the most part, it's actually been pretty benign. And uh, there's a lot of exciting road yet. If you haven't seen Green Road yet, please do go check that out. That has, has turned into a really top-notch project. Yeah, in fact, uh, one of my counterparts in Chapel Hill really loves the green paint. And I know that that was a, a bit of a chore to get our, uh, our, our engineering crew on board with that, particularly we're worried about the maintenance cost. Uh, but it really is the icing on the cake. It really is what completes the, the facility in terms of the way it feels. And we have one big outstanding uh, resurfacing project that we are waiting on with NCDOT, uh, and that is the uh, Edwards Mill Road uh, resurfacing work. Uh, and that'll be from um, roughly from the um, arena entrance all the way down to Crabtree Valley. And that will include restriping for buffered bike lanes throughout the entire corridor. That's going to be pretty, uh, pretty landmark as well. And I'm looking forward to writing that one. Uh, Atlantic Avenue is getting bike lanes. They are six feet, but two feet of that is gutter pan, so they are four foot, and they are just a stripe. Everybody's really excited, and I'm like, don't get too excited. But still, a 2% improvement is an improvement, and it's getting our foot in the door. Um, that one is still pending, but uh, I did present at the Mordecai CAC uh, to talk to them about what to expect, and uh, we talked about the kickoff uh, September 30th, with our consultant to talk about what's the long-term strategy looking from roughly i guess old lewisburg you know i always thought I'd say from the circus um all the way up to high woods wolf pack on the other side of the belt line and there are three major pinch points there one is the bridge across the railroad one is the bridge across crabtree creek and one is get, getting across the belt line um, so that's a pretty major undertaking in terms of what it would take to get a separated facility the length of that corridor um, but we're going to look at it and see what's feasible and get try to get an idea of how much it would cost so that we can start that teeing up those projects. Um, on the other front, which is the standalone markings, uh, we have a few of our projects. If you go out and look, uh, I hear tell that there are little uh, tiny bike uh, symbols painted on the pavement, which is where the crews go out and begin doing uh, the preliminary work to resurface. Uh, they were present on Shanta Drive two weeks ago uh, when we were coming back from the Ratchford event. Uh, I circled through to look at some of those projects to see where they were. And you could see that the preliminary markings that they were using to sketch it out for the final crew were already on the ground out there. It may be on the ground. I have not had time to go look. Uh, I don't know that the bollards are in place yet, but all of those projects are progressing. They are right on time. So I'm super happy with all of those. Um, the other news I've got, a lot of you may have already heard, I am leaving the city at the end of the month. I'm going to be moving to the private sector. Um, so I always tell people, well, what are you going to be doing? And I said, well, you know that, that great bike plan we have? I get to be the person who writes those bike plans. And I'll be working all over the state and, and uh, sort of the southeastern U.S. Uh, I'm looking forward to having a little bit of variety. Um, but I'm going to miss all the folks at the city. It's a great crew here. 
and uh, we've achieved a lot. I won't miss people yelling at me about taking their parking. I will admit that. Well, Mr. Black, uh, we got a job for you because one of the points to come out of the meeting with the Jasons was they're both like, I'm not really sure what the bike plan is for anymore after that text change. We need to rethink what the bike plan is for. So. so funny you should mention that. There is actually a citywide strategic plan, and one of the initiatives is to look at updating the bike plan. Uh, Carmen Kwan from the planning department and uh, Dale Tiska, who is with engineering services, are co-leading that effort, and they've uh, Barbara sits on that committee. Uh, they brought me in, and we've walked through I think what is starting to look like a, a pretty good framework, and they presented that to the management team. They call it the core team uh, last week on, was it Thursday or Friday, I think, Barbara? Um, and it looks pretty good. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with what they've come up with. Again, it's a really great team and, you know, walking them through some of the, the issues that I've had in the position and looking at the mismatch between, you know, if you remember those eight separated projects, and some of them are moving along, but they're going to take many years. They're tied to BRT. They're tied to the Six Forks project. Um, so folks are like, where are my separated bike lanes? And I'm like, they're in process. They'll be built in about five to seven years. Um, I think there's a disconnect there with what folks are expecting. And so we want to update the plan to say, hey, we still need to do that work. We need to do these preliminary uh, feasibility studies to get an idea of what they're going to take and how long they'll take so that we can we can make them happen and look at those more difficult, more expensive corridors. And then we need a way to sort of inform the work that we're doing on a day to day basis. Um, resurfacing is going to get, you know, get built green road. We've got two projects giving us uh, side paths uh, on Atlantic and on uh, Treywick Marsh Creek. And there's going to be a big gap in the middle. Oh, and Brentwood, too. And so the Brentwood neighborhood itself was the gap. And so our standalone program is going to be able to come in and, and do the neighborhood bikeway that was in the plan. And it will connect those other four projects. So how do we find those things that happen because of all those opportunistic things that pop up that we can't predict that well? Commissioner Thomas. Paul, can I can I ask you real quick about the, the Gorman Street project? Because I, I drove by there the other day and it looks like it's coming along. Um, between Sullivan and I think Hillsboro, if not further along, it, it it looks like it's going to be great. I'm excited to ride that and that on pace to be finished as planned. Or as far as I know, the last time I talked with the project manager and engineering services, they still think the middle of next month, so roughly 30 days out. Great, looking forward to that. And the, and the suggestions we heard at the the bike walk safety summit for really you know making things better is is not letting you leave. So uh, I'm not sure how to do that at this point, but that was one of the main suggestions. So. You'll be missed. Oh, thank you. That's it. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, is just that, that hand raised, Commissioner Caruso? Yeah, just to add a quick comment uh, as far as the Atlantic Avenue section, I, I drive through there almost every day and the project's starting to go down now. And, and while I agree it's that, <laughs> that that bike lane is is pretty tight, I will say, Anecdotally, it, it's already, it seems, having a pretty noticeable uh, impact on traffic calming. So now with the, with the roadway or the, lot, the lines kind of narrowing in there, um, I think it is improving um, that area for, for people outside of vehicles, even if the um, bike lane isn't kind of up to the standards we would hope for, at least currently. That's great news. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Black. And then I have a couple of updates as well. Um, I included some pictures of the two new Citric Cycle stations on the board docs agenda. So be sure to take a look at those or go visit them in person. Um, they're not operational yet. We're having some inspections done um, and doing some mechanical and electrical tests to make sure everything's fully functional. Um, so I will keep the commission updated when those stations will be online. Um, I also wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the scooter parking pilot that we'll be launching soon on Glenwood Avenue. Um, this will be between Johnson Street and Hillsborough Street on Glenwood South. Um, we'll be installing eight in-street parking corrals on Glenwood and then five on some of the side streets on that corridor. Um, so those being Tucker Street, North Street, and Johnson Street. Um, and so we're working really closely with our operators on some of the 
back office technology to help with enforcing uh, proper parking behavior on that corridor and hopefully going to have some positive results. And other than that, that's it for me. Thank you. I took a look at those pictures and they look very excellent. Can't wait to go try them out. I also want to know who uh, does your maps. Those are really pretty maps. Someday I'd like to learn how y'all put those kiosks together, but this is not the time. <laughs> All right, I think that does it for the staff reports. Uh, coming down next, we come to general board comments. And so we are past our time, but I will open this up to general board comments. I will ask you to keep your comments concise. And uh, the floor is open to whomever would like to claim it first. This is, ah, uh, there we go. Three at once. I saw Mr. Caruso first, so I'll let him go. Then Ms. Gellenbeck, then Ms. Hatcher. Thank you. I, I looked up uh, while we're on a quick recess. I looked up the Night of Lights uh, event page, and if I'm looking at the website right, unfortunately, it looks like both of the bike nights are already sold out. So hopefully, they'll open up more tickets or potentially have another night or something. But as far as I can tell, we're already sold out. So I'm sorry to I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think I might have the solution. This happened to a bunch of folks. Happened to me when I was on there five minutes after they went on sale. Um, if you go into the regular ticket section and so, and like see all the open nights and look for the bike nights, they're they're sold out. I think they do that so that people don't accidentally buy bike night tickets when they want to drive their car. So you have to go back to the event landing page, and there's like a bike nights little link. And you look, go to learn more about the bike night, and then you could buy tickets through there, and there's only two days available, and it's the two bike night days, and it is confusing. I see. But, okay, I'll check it out. Thanks. You're welcome. And I believe next up, I can't remember who was next, uh, Ms. Gellenbeck. Let's go with that. Thank you, Mr. Otwell. Uh, yeah, I wanted to um, make just a uh, Couple comments. One is to give a shout out to B Persons with the DOT, the community engagement officer. She led the pack for the um, Trevor Garden and she pulled in multiple uh, public agencies to uh, have this thing really um, give its robust effort. She brought in uh, Raleigh's Parks and Recs Department. Uh, they participated in the planning as well as uh, Wake County's. Um, Safe routes to school coordinator Jennifer Delcourt, and so and, and Oaks and Spokes also participated in this. So there was also the uh, nonprofit uh, uh, agencies, and of course, uh, resident volunteer. <laughs> uh, so um, even though I seem to be like the face of traffic gardens, I just want everyone to understand that there is a, a real dynamic team behind it that have made it effortlessly for me to be able to do what I love to do. So um, shout out to B for her work. Um, the stroll in the streets was fabulous. I wanted to ask if um, the staff would send um, the commissioners the link to for public survey comments. Um, I noticed uh, on one social media post that they said they did not participate uh, in the event itself, but was familiar enough with it. So they made comments um, in that capacity. Uh, so the city has really used that event to try, try to acquire feedback from residents to see if this is working, how can they do it better? One of the things that I loved about the stroll in the streets was a uh, pop-up uh, traffic circle or a roundabout that converted one of the four-way stops to the to a circle. Now you really couldn't use it because the officer was there ma making sure that the cross street vehicle traffic wasn't entering the circle while you were there. But uh, roundabouts are uh, terrific, and so I was really happy with that. I rode and my was, bike around it though. I got to use it. I did too. Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Longwell, but I I think I had the officer giggling at me for a while. I even took a picture. He must think I'm crazy, but. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of them, and I and it, it would be really awesome if we could you know, do pilot projects um, with roundabouts at these four way stop signs uh, to see if they really do improve the efficiency. I know that they could possibly even be not only traffic calmer, but also reduce uh, emissions from the stop and go. 
um, that we do for vehicle traffic. And it's easier when you're a bike rider to not have to stop at a stop sign. So all those for the, all those reasons, I'm a fan. Uh, stroll in the streets. Um, I'd really love to see this be more widespread throughout Raleigh. Um, we've given a lot of attention to downtown, which I, I can understand why. But we have so many people who contact us and are talking about their area that they live in Raleigh. And I think that there's a lot more for us to see and do. I think it could uh, help with um, Council Member Melton's um, uh, goal of that 15 minute uh, city environment. Um, so since we are, you know, we can't reach every place inside 15 minutes, but if we can from our home reach the needs that we, we, we have, uh, that would be great. And identifying those needs through these stroll in the streets events, I think is, is really important. So uh, kudos to this government for doing it. And yes, let's, let's see if we can do it a little bit farther out of downtown. Um, oh, and last but not least, sorry, but I have to make a comment. It's about the protective bike lanes and the trees, the branches that reach into them and smack me. I can't say enough that it's time for us to really put it on our radar that the, these protected bike lanes, the, this, the, the landscape that grows into it really has to become a priority for us. Uh, I'm about ready to go out there with my clippers. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mary Jo, I, 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 I let the city arborist know about the ones on West Street. Um, if they haven't been taken care of, email me. And if there are any others besides them, let me know. But I actually contacted them about a month ago because um, I had the same experience. Well, it's true. Uh, they're still there. And they're also uh, on um, on Harrington as well, Paul. Somebody went in and, and cut back uh, some grass that was growing in there just uh, north of the, on Harrington's protected land, just north of the, um, where the railroad tracks cross it. Um, but the branches are there. So thank you. I appreciate you. That's it. I'm out. Thank you, Ms. Gellenbeck. Uh, Commissioner Hatchell. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to just um, briefly mention, uh, perhaps she's left us now, but I wanted to mention how much I enjoyed working with Liz Hester, and I'm really excited um, that, uh, you know, she's been with us, and I wanted to thank her for her service. And as a short-timer myself, um, I, I believe my anniversary is November 3rd or 4th, and it, and it will be six years for me, so I will... I'm not uh, eligible to be re-upped, um, but I think over the years that I've been doing this, I'm really excited to see the commission really grow and blossom and, and more ac accurately maybe reflect the, our community in terms of uh, the type of people who serve, and I'm really excited about that. So as I'm getting ready to leave, I'm hoping that perhaps a more senior person um, will be considered um, so that... Uh, we, we have good representation from our seniors population. I think I've talked to several of you about this before, um, because I think it's really uh, an important thing to keep in mind that as people get older, not only are they more at risk for being uh, injured or uh, killed by in, in, as a pedestrian, but they also, you know, you start losing certain abilities um, and certain uh, capabilities to be be out there. So I think it's really great that the the uh, group has changed over the years that I've been involved in it. And I would really love to see that continue. And although uh, all of us are getting older a day at a time, if we're lucky, I do think that um, the senior population is really an important uh, group to be considered when it comes to our bicycling and pedestrian infrastructure. So hopefully I'll be with you next month. Maybe not, but anyway, thank you. Uh, wonderful, uh, Ms. Hatchell, uh, thank you. Uh, I, Ms. Gellenbeck. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I just wanted to uh, reinforce what Ms. Hatchell just mentioned at the about the seniors. Uh, uh, Mr. Neptune, you might be able to um, uh, confirm or not, but uh, Ms. Schmidt uh, presentation at the Biking and Walking Summit uh, identified the, that age group as um, the majority of people who are being injured as pedestrians. And so she brings a, a real solid 
not only is it like our personal experience, but the data backs it up is a really vulnerable group and we should bring uh, their voice to the table. So thank you for bringing that up. Thanks. All right, Commissioner Caruso. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly amend my <laughs> comments from a second ago. I pulled up the website again, and and you were right. Uh, it is a little tricky, but if you go to the WRL website and scroll down, um, there's a separate link for the for the bike night. So if anyone if you're looking for tickets for that, um, there are already a number of time slots sold out. So if you want to go, get your tickets now. But but there is a separate. Uh, Link that you need to click to get the bike night ones. Good. Glad I could help out. Do we have any more comments from the commission? We call them board comments, but we're not. Are we board? I guess we're type of board. Commission as a board. Um, anyway, uh, I, I too wanted to thank Ms. Hester for her time with us. I'm sorry that she had to, to knock off. Um, but I'll send her an email and thank her in person. We appreciated her service and we'll miss her. Keep y'all posted on uh, what comes next and what the nominations look like. We have next upcoming events and I have one. Next Sunday is the Crank for a Cause with the uh, Crank Arm and Oaks and Spokes is putting on a Thanksgiving fundraiser. I will be leading one of the uh, one of the rides that goes and visits a couple of different breweries. You can purchase tickets and go on a ride and you get to do a raffle. And it's going to be sure awesome. Everybody next, should come. Sunday? next Sunday. Mr. Yes. Otwell? No, I don't think so. Mr. Otwell, I believe that the Crank for a Cause event will be on October 31st. Is that not next Sunday? Next Sunday will be October 24th. I lost a week. <laughs> Thank you for that's the, See what I try to get? We'll see what gets when I try to put something on the uh, upcoming events. I'll just leave that to better minds. It's the thought that counts. We'll see, not if anybody shows up next week. <laughs> In costume. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been me if you hadn't told me, so thanks. If I may, uh, while, while I have you, um, you know, just briefly, I would say for anybody who wants to participate in the remaining uh, Walktober events, uh, you, you, all you need to do is go to our RaleighNC.gov website and type in Walktober, and it will take you to the full calendar of events. We've got a number of walking tours, historic tours, the great Oakwood Cemetery tour on October 30th that I'm looking forward to. Um, but we'd love to see, again, all of our commissioners and, and all of our friends and, and families out there uh, for the remaining Walktober events. Yeah, Commissioner Barsness. Uh, yes, I actually did. Sign. I was bummed that I was out of town, out of state this week because I missed this weekend because I missed some of the events. But I'm doing the uh, event that starts at Cameron Village and we either bike or walk to somewhere else. I can't remember, but I'm yeah, signed yeah. up for that. Yeah, so th I believe that's the bike walk rail event on Saturday, October 23rd. Yes, that is it. From 9.30 to 11.30, I hope to see you out there. I'm also planning to attend, very much looking forward to that uh, that event. Good. So I'm bringing my son. He doesn't know that yet, but I'm bringing him. And I so I don't, I don't know if this happened to you guys, but uh, I got in the mail a because I emailed the person in charge if you needed to reserve a Citrix bike, and I do because both my bike's tires are deflated. So in the mail, I got a T-shirt, and then I got a plaque with my name on it that says "Bike and um, whatever B Pack," but spelled out. What do we stand for? So I was just curious. Why did I get that? Was I supposed to have that before? I was excited to get the T-shirt and the little name thing. Yeah, no, those those went out to all of the B Pack members. Um, okay. Those are our October T-shirts, and then the name plates are just something. Um, I think those were requested back in May when we were doing some of the events, and oh. the BPAC members wanted people from the public to know that they represented the city. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate awesome. it. And I, I will note that is the first Walktober T-shirt we've ever done. Oh, really? Well, good. And I'm you sure. and and B again, B B person was really the the mastermind behind that. I just nagged her a lot. Yeah. Well, good. I I very much appreciate it. Thank you. 
I enjoyed wearing my uh, name tag when I went up to Senator Ross. It felt very <laughs> official. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say, I love having the name tab, even though I'm a short timer, but um, I wore it to the, to the open streets event and to the white cane and, and so I've worn it two times and it was so much easier for people to come up to me uh, because I was known to them. So I think that that is, I really encourage people to wear that name tag when you're out because it certainly was an icebreaker and um, you know, if you went up to booths or whatever you did, people are like, oh, you, you know, so it, it's definitely very much appreciated. Yeah. If, I, if I could just briefly echo Ms. Hatchell, you know, when I was leaving the White Cane Safety Day, you know, I had my name tag on and I was I was biking across downtown and I ran into four ladies, four ladies that I would say uh, were active adults, if I may. And uh, but they were they were they were lost. I mean, they were trying to find uh, like Whiskey Kitchen or something, but they were maybe two blocks away. They couldn't quite get oriented. But then they saw me and I saw them and we started talking. They're like, oh, Nick Neptune with the bicycle pedestrian crew. Maybe you can help us. I said, I'd love to help you. And so then we talked about the whole night that they wanted to plan out for themselves. And I offered them some guidance and, and care. And they were active users of our pedestrian infrastructure for the rest of the Friday evening. So either way, it was um, it was very helpful in the moment. But even all throughout this weekend, just being out and about with strolling the streets, just, you know, meeting people and talking to folks and, you know, whether they're, you know, new friends or, uh, or old. I mean, it was just, it was really nice to have. It was very helpful. So thank you for, you know, to, to the team, to the staff for, for facilitating that. Well, Mr. Neptune, thank you for that story because I was approached many times during the stroll in the streets and I didn't know why people kept coming up to me. <laughs> it had to have been because of what had it because of the main time. <laughs> they were asking me all kinds of questions like I was in charge. <laughs> I simply pointed to the right people. It's, it's that and the air of authority. This has been a <laughs> oh, that's perhaps the most thing. animated uh, upcoming <laughs> events section of the VPAC meeting that I've ever been a that participant to. I told you. There's <laughs> a lot going on. <laughs> Do we have any more uh, upcoming events? Does that cover what everybody has? Oh, uh, sorry, but yeah, the Bike Walk NC Summit is coming up in uh, three weeks. So, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. you know, that's the first weekend in November. Uh, they have a choose your price, so um, that fits everybody's budget. And I think it's going to be really great. It's going to be both in person, so if you have time to come in, um, get up close and personal with the speakers. That's happening in Durham, but it's also being uh, live streamed. So uh, presentations will be virtual, uh, virtually accessible as well. So bike walk and see summit, find it on the internet. <laughs> Excellent. All right, if there's no more announcements for upcoming events, we will confirm our next BPAC meeting will be on Monday, November 15th at 6 p.m. Is everybody good with that? All right, no problems with that. We'll move on and I will thank everybody for their time tonight. Thank you for being brief in your comments and helping us move things along. And thanks for a wonderful meeting. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you.